team um, and to uh, edify and encourage one another. As we go through this time of Sunday school, um, I pray that our hearts are encouraged, that uh, by your word, if there's any need for us to be convicted of sin, that we would be convicted of sin, um, and ultimately that we are pointed towards you and the hope and victory that we have in you. In your name we pray, amen. So I'm Elijah Hoyer. Uh, I am filling in this morning for, for Ben. Um, Ben's still in Mexico, and I'll give that again as an announcement before worship service. Um, but I am from Wichita, Kansas, and I moved to the Charlotte area about four years ago, and I moved there for seminary. So uh, I'm currently at Reformed Theological Seminary, been there for about three and a half-ish years. I've got who knows how long left. It seems like it's just continuing on and continuing on. Um, and then I'm also the youth director at First ARP Church in Rock Hill. So do that full-time, seminary part-time. Our Sunday School lesson for today is called Wisdom for Living in an Anti-Christian Age. Now, I want to start off with a story before giving the landscape of culture and then seeing what Scripture has to say about the culture that we currently live in. You know, I, I grew up, um, I was born in 97, so I'm a young guy, um, but I was born in 97, grew up in the 2000s, and from the time I was in middle school, Going into high school, I saw a radical shift in culture. You know, in middle school, I would look around, and most of my friends would say they somewhat belonged to a church. And if they didn't claim a church, they would at least say that over the summer, they would attend VBS at certain churches, right? Well, by the time I hit high school, it seemed like this general thought of, hey, we kind of belong to a church, completely evaporated. It just kind of vanished. So I enter into high school, I'm talking about Christian morality, Christian thought on sex and ethics, and those in my school were utterly opposed to this. There was a huge shift that was going on in culture. And before it seemed there, there was somewhat of a positive sense towards Christianity, to now when we look at our culture in 2024, it's a rather negative shift in culture. I was reading a book by Aaron Wren called Life in the Negative World, and he gives three movements in culture, and he follows the type of political scandals that define these three movements. So the first one is positive culture, and this is what we saw throughout most of the 1900s. This is not to say that those in culture were necessarily all Christians, but it's to say that if you belonged to a church, you tended to have somewhat of a positive outcome in society, right? I believe it's Eisenhower who, before running for a presidential race, decided to become a member of a church so that he would have an upper hand in the political rally that he had going on. So there was this kind of positive culture that came with churches. Again, that's not to say that everyone was a Christian because it was through the 1900s that liberalism was rising in the church. But it's the thought that there is a positive thought in culture, and it, w it, would be, it would be a benefit of you to belong to a church. Now, looking at a scandal that happened um, in, the, in the political realm, you have the presidential candidate Gary Hart. This was in 1987. And he was running for president until he had allegations of having, affair, having an affair with Donna Rice. And immediately, he was forced to drop out of the presidential race. So that's the first movement of culture that we see. And that is the culture that was broadly in America up until around 1997. Well, around 98, we start seeing another shift. It's no longer that we're in a positive culture towards the church, but now we're more in a neutral culture, right? So this type of culture, it can be explained in this way. You know, it's not necessarily of benefit for you to belong to church, but it's not a negative for you to belong in a church. A lot of people would rather your religion be rather of a private thing or something like that. Um, but generally, the thought towards the church was not positive or negative. It was, you do you, as long as you don't step on my toes, we're going to be all right. We also see another shift in political culture. You know, before when a presidential candidate had an affair, 
he was expected to step down. But something happened in 1998. And I assume you all know what it is. Uh, Bill Clinton had an affair. And you would expect that that would mean, oh, you need to step down. But that's not what happens. You know, he goes through the trials. And in the end, the outcome of the court was what he does in his personal life does not necessarily affect the job he has as president. So we see another shift in culture there. Well, that was, that was a lot of the world I grew up in, was negative or was the neutral culture. Didn't really matter if you belonged to a church or not, but generally the thought towards Christians was, hey, they exist. It's fine that they're here, just as long as they don't step on our toes. But that's not the culture we live in anymore, right? We're living in a negative culture. At this point, it is of little to no benefit in the cultural lens to belong to a church. In fact, belonging to a church could harm your reputation with some of your neighbors, with some of your coworkers. And the reality is, is that the thing that is promoted in culture is the LGBTQ ideology. Now, when I say that, that you may not know what all that means. That, that is the ideology of the sexual revolution. You can be whoever you want. If, you, if you're a guy and you want to like guys, you can like guys. If you're a girl and you want to marry a girl, you can marry girls. That is the ideology of the LGBTQ culture. And in our culture, we see um, that it is being promoted that unless you promote this, you will then be an outcast in society. And I experienced that when I was in high school. That was a shift that I saw. And 2015 was a pivotal year. We had the Obergefell decision, which was the decision to allow for same-sex marriage. And it was, that was such a shift in culture. And I, re I remember experiencing this in high school. You know, in middle school, the general thought was, it's kind of weird to be homosexual. That was just the general thought. But when I entered high school, and I had a debate in my freshman history class, whether or not we should legalize same-sex marriage, I was the only one standing up saying, no, scripture says this is wrong. God has a good design and plan for our life, and that is for one man and one woman to be married. And immediately, when I looked around at my classroom, they all had eyes filled of hate towards me. So there was this huge shift that was going on in culture. So I want to ask you guys, in your life, have you experienced this, and how have you experienced this? The shift from, negative cult from positive culture to negative culture, how have you experienced this shift? Same way you did? The same way I did, yeah. Any other ways? Maybe you experience it with family a little bit. I know that's a bit personal, but... What's that? Unbelievable. It's unbelievable, right? And we look at this culture, and we, we end up asking this culture of, what do we do now? What do we do now? You know, it's easy for us to have this thought of, let's just bury our hand, heads in the sand and just stay to ourselves and recognize that at some point this whole world's going to have judgment. That, yeah, that's what a lot of people did. Yeah. Yep. And that's not what we should do. We shouldn't bury our head in the sand. The other thought of what we could do, and I don't agree with this one, but I do think there's a place for something like this, is for us to step up and be revolutionaries, try to overthrow the government. And I don't think that's what we ought to do. In fact, I would argue that scripture does not say that. There is a place for men to step up and to lead in government, but I would not say that's what we need to do is just overthrow the government. I believe scripture gives us clear steps as we look at the life of Daniel. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open up to the book of Daniel. And um, we're going to look at some of the different passages uh, in Daniel. I've been teaching this to my youth group, and I found it to be very beneficial, very practical for them as they are interacting with their friends at school, because most of my students are still in public school. And in the book of Daniel, when you look at chapter 1, he, here's kind of the landscape of what is happening. You have the, the kingdom of Judah, 
that they had actually been in sin. They had been in rebellion against God. And the Lord in his righteous judgment decreed and called for Babylon, the king, the king Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to then come across into the west and to completely demolish the kingdom of Judah. And then he then gets some of the young, young folks of the city and brings them from Judah all the way to Babylon. And that is the beginning of the book of Daniel. He is telling of that, of Daniel and his friends being taken to Babylon. So let, let's get this into perspective. Daniel and his friends would have been raised in a culture that while it was still sinful, they would have been somewhat familiar with God's word. In fact, it's evidence, there's evidence that Daniel and his friends were indeed God-fearers who were walking in light of the fear of God. And, and they wanted to honor and glorify God. So that is a culture that they've been raised in. And they are then plucked out of that culture and dropped in a culture that is completely different. It's completely other than what they grew up in. I think we can kind of have that feeling, right? Culture shifted so much over the last 20, 27 years that I've been alive. And I'm sure it's shifted even more in your lifetimes. You know, just simply the creation of this, the phone. Like, we have supercomputers in our pockets. You look around at culture, and the world that you grew up in looks radically different than the world that we live in now. And that's kind of what's happening with Daniel and his friends. The world that they grew up in, what they were comfortable with, what they knew, was completely destroyed. And they were picked up and put into a completely pagan world. And they had to learn how to adjust to this. So, how do we adjust to this? You know, there's temptation for us to conform to the world. To say the world's changed and we need to just get with the, get with the train. But that's not what we ought to do. We, we, we need to look at God's word and see what God's word tells us to do. So I would say point number one is we need to acknowledge God's sovereignty. We need to acknowledge God's sovereignty in all of this. And in chapter one, we see several times, if you look at, um, let's see, what verse is it? Verse two, chapter one, verse two. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. Look at those first two words, or first three words. The Lord gave. This was the Lord's doing. The Lord ordained it to be so, that, they, that the kingdom of Judah would be destroyed. The Lord ordained it to be so, that Daniel and his friends would be plucked out of the kingdom of Judah and placed into the kingdom of Babylon. Also, we see several times throughout this passage that God gave. God gave Dan Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. The Lord gave. We need to acknowledge God's sovereignty in the world that we are currently li living in. It is not a mistake that you are alive, living in, in uh, Clover in the year 2024. God has you here for a purpose. The Lord has ordained it to be that we have had the presidents that we have. And he's going to ordain it to be whoever our next president will be. It is not a mistake that we are here. But we are here for a purpose. And we are here underneath the sovereignty of God. Let's look at chapter 2. Chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has this crazy dream. He has no idea what's going on. And Daniel is able to interpret this dream because God gave him wisdom and insight. And when Daniel understands what this dream is because the Lord reveals it to him, this is how, the, how Daniel responds to the Lord. Let's look at verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and in the light, and light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. 
for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we have asked you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Notice what he is saying here. God is sovereign over all. He is sovereign over the seasons. He is sovereign over the times. So the time that we are living in right now in an anti-Christian world is ordained by God, which is crazy for us to wrap our minds around. But we must acknowledge that the Lord is over the seasons and he will set up whoever he desires and he will tear down whoever desires. And ultimately, it will be for God's glory. So, first, we must acknowledge God's sovereignty. Second, we must trust that God will protect and preserve his church. Again, they are in a very hostile world. I'm sure most of you know the story of Daniel and his friends. In chapter 3, we see that Daniel and his friends, or specifically his friends, were not willing to bow down to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had made. And Nebuchadnezzar put, put out this edict that unless you bow down and worship the statue, you will then be thrown into the fiery furnace and you will be killed. Well, Daniel and his friend, or Daniel's friends were not willing to bow down. They, they, they desired to honor the Lord. They knew that only God is worthy of worship and praise. So they are then facing against the superpower of the world. And they are trusting that the Lord will protect them and guard them. Uh, chapter 3, let's go ahead and turn there and look at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We need to have this type of faith. We need to have this type of confidence in the ability of God to preserve his church. I think it can be easy for us to be fearful of the powers that be. It can be easy for us to be fearful of our reputation being tarnished because we decide to stand for the truth of God's word. Do we have greater fear of man than we have greater fear of God? That's a question we need to meditate on. Who are we fearing more? Are we fearing the wrath of man? Or do we fear the power of God in such a way that it motivates us to stand on the truth of God's word. But also, Daniel and his friends knew the goodness of God. It's not just fear that motivates them, but it's the goodness of God that motivates them. They know that God is a covenant-keeping God who will preserve his church till the end. And so that's what he does with Daniel's friends. Eventually, Nebuchadnezzar throws them into the furnace. But what happens when they're in the furnace? I'm sure some of you know it. What happens when they're in the furnace? They're not burned. Then you see a random fourth person appear, which I am fully convinced that this is a pre-incarnate Christ being with them in the midst of the fire. And they come out of the fire and their clothes are not singed. God preserved his people. We see this again in Daniel chapter 6 with Daniel in the lion's den where the, where Dan, where the Lord shut the lion's mouths when Daniel was cast in. And the next morning, the king, King Darius, came up to Daniel. And was like, Daniel, are you still alive? And Daniel's just there. You can almost imagine him with his head on one of the lions, his feet up on the other lion, saying, yeah, I was cool. The Lord saved me. This is great. The Lord will preserve his church. That is not to say we won't go through suffering. But it is to say that the Lord will make sure his church stays till the end of the age. And at the end of the age, his faithful people will be exalted over all of his enemies. Let's stand for the truth and trust that God will protect and preserve his church. Third, we need to be people of prayer. Prayer is all throughout the book of Daniel. 
you know, in, in chapters 10 and 11, and we're not going to read that because there's just a lot of crazy imagery and we don't, we don't necessarily have time to break apart what's all going on there. But the key thing that we see there is that when you look at the nations, <coughs> there are spiritual forces involved. There are angels backing up certain kings. There are demons backing up other kings. And there is a spiritual war that is at hand that is then manifests through the nations of the world. So when we have this in mind and we look at our culture, we have to acknowledge that the evilness, the wickedness that is going on is demonic to the core. And we don't fight this fight with physical weapons. But our fight is spiritual. It's not with flesh and blood, but it is with the principalities of the darkness of the world. It is with Satan. So how do we fight Satan? Through prayer. Through the word of God. And that is what Daniel was known for so much throughout the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6, we see that when the king puts an edict, you must pray to me. You cannot make petition to any other god. What does Daniel do? says, no, I'm not going to pray to you. He then goes up to his upper chamber where he had gone three times a day for the last how many years? At this point, he's probably 60 or 70 years old. And, he, and it was known by the people that three times a day he was going to go up to his upper chamber and pray. When you see in Daniel chapter, chapter 2, when the, there's this dream of Nebuchadnezzar and it's bothering Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, unless the wise men can interpret my dream... I will then rip them all to shreds. When Daniel hears this, he knows that that means him and his friends are going to be ripped to shreds. So what does he then do? He gets his friends together and he says, let's go to God to beg for mercy. That the Lord would be gracious towards us. That he would reveal the dream to us so that our lives may be spared. Daniel was a man of prayer. And in Daniel chapter 9, we see one of the most profound prayers from Daniel. Let's go ahead and turn there. Daniel's praying to God and he's wondering, when are we going to return home? When are we going to return to, to the kingdom of Judah? When can we rebuild the temple? When can the walls around the city be rebuilt? And as he's there, he is lamenting and he is mourning the sins of the people of Israel. And he says in verse 7, To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that, that they have committed against you. To you, O Lord, or to us, O Lord, belongs shame. To our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Let us not think that we are the holy, holy, righteous man. Let us also acknowledge our sin. It is so easy to look at the sins of the culture around us and to have this pompous self-righteousness and yet be completely blind to our sins, to the sins of the church and to the ways that we have compromised. Let us be honest with ourselves and acknowledge that we are sinners too and go to the Lord seeking His mercy, seeking His forgiveness. And we are to pray with strong faith. And when we go to the Lord and we go to the Lord in repentance, we should pray with this strong faith. Let's look at verse 19 of chapter 9. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. We can go to the Lord with prayers of repentance. We can go to the Lord with big petitions, with the struggles that are at hand, because we are marked by his name. And when we know that there is a spiritual war at hand, we do not fight with physical weapons, but we fight through prayer and through the use of God's word. 
knowing that the Lord works through those very simple yet profound means. This is how the Lord wants us to interact with this culture. We need to be praying for the world. Let's, let's think about this upcoming presidential election. It's a, it's, I don't want to get too political, but it's not great options. But let's be in prayer that the Lord will use whoever the next candidate is for his glory. That the Lord would bring them to repentance and to acknowledge the kingship of Christ and bow down before the throne of God. As Psalm chapter 2 says, kiss the king lest you perish. May we be in prayer for our, for our magistrates, for our governors, for our mayors, for our senators, for our, our upcoming presidential election, that they would acknowledge Christ as king and proclaim boldly the truth of God's word. The last point is that we need to be faithful in small things. Uh, go, you're already at chapter 9, but go ahead and go back to chapter 8. I'm not going to spend much time breaking this apart, but Daniel had this crazy vision. He had no idea what to do with it. The Lord then sends an angel to then uh, reveal parts of the vision to him. And, and long story short, uh, if you look at the history of Israel, there are these beasts that represent nations. Um, one of the beasts represented the kingdoms of Media and Persia. And then the other beasts represented the kingdom of Greece, led by Alexander the Great. All this crazy imagery happens, and then there's this symbol of this little horn that comes up against God's people to, to test them, to, to try to bring them down, to cause them to stumble. And, and this little horn then goes up against the Prince of Princes, which is Christ. And the Prince of Princes immediately destroys the horn. Daniel receives this vision, and he is utterly distraught. And in verse 27, he says, And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I arose and went about the king's business. But I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. I think we can relate with that statement. We look around at the world and it's easy for us to be appalled and confused by what is going on. There are certain things that go on in the world that may cause us to be sick. But let's bring that even a little bit closer to home. You look in your communities and there are things going on that you may be appalled by and confused by. And let's bring that even closer. There are things going on in your own life with personal connections that you are going to be appalled by, confused by. You may hear of divorce in the church. You may hear of people um, leaving their spouse. You may hear of child abuse within some, some of your loved one's families. And you look at that and you're appalled, you're confused, and you're sickened by it. What should we do with this? I think the answer here, with all the other things that I just mentioned, is to be faithful in the small things. Daniel received this crazy vision that left him sick, appalled, and confused. But it says, then I rose and went about the king's business. Where has the Lord placed you? Where are you working? Maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you do landscaping. Maybe you're retired and you have several connections with other folks that are retired. Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom. Maybe you're a business owner. Where has the Lord placed you? Think about that and realize God placed you there for a very specific reason. Be faithful where you are at. Work hard to the glory of God. And as you come in contact with other people, the Lord will allow opportunities for you to be a radiant light to the world. It can be easy for us to fall into this thought of, oh, we need to do something big. We need to do something flashy. And when we do that big and flashy thing, then we will see revival in America. But what have I told you? Revival and conversion of the lost comes through the simple things in life. 
such as you being a good neighbor, being a good teacher, being a good business owner, and living your life in the simple way to the glory of God. So, when we look around at culture, yes, we are in an anti-Christian world, but we are not without hope. Christ wins in the end, and God is sovereign over all, and we are in existence in the year 2024 for the glory of God and for his purposes. Are, are there any questions or any comments that you guys would like to add before I close this out in prayer? All right, I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. Lord, as we uh, get ready for the worship service uh, here in a little bit, be preparing our hearts. Quiet our hearts from the anxiety of this world. There are many things that we look at that we are confused by, that we are appalled by, um, things in this world that may cause us to be sick. But we know that you are sovereign over all and that you are in control and that you will preserve your people. We come here this morning to be reminded of that, to be encouraged. And we come with anticipation and excitement to worship your great name at this next hour. We thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, it seems I ended a bit early. So, anything that we should do? Or just hang out for a bit? All right. So we'll hang out. Service will be at 11 o'clock.